afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Every year the UVM Extension 4-H program touches the lives of thousands of young Vermonters by teaching life skills through hands-on learning. Today we're going to meet one of the young Vermonters in 4-H and learn about the skills that he gained through his 4-H project. The young man is 16-year-old David Gringari from West Haven. David was trying to find the right horse for his project, which involves showing the horse at fairs and clinics, as well as caring for the horse and keeping all the proper records. It's work that takes time, energy, and money. During his search, David did a lot of problem solving, and he learned a lot of valuable information about finding just the right horse. And to help others, David has put together a guide to finding the right 4-H project horse. David is with us this afternoon, along with his 4-H leader, Deb Danforth. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Uh, Deb, tell us about the horse education in 4-H, and what are the skills involved, and what's the overall goal? Well, in the 4-H horse program, our, our youth learn about horses through a variety of events and experiences at the club, county, and state levels. We offer hands-on activities at club meetings, fairs, and workshops. We have riding clinics, knowledge contests, and horse judging contests. Plus, we teach them about the daily care and responsibility. Uh, we use um, a wide variety of life skills with the horse as the medium to teach those. Those range from mentoring to teamwork and leadership, public speaking, and direct handling and riding of the horse. Mm -hmm. And so what can you share with us about David and the work that he did? David joined Horsepower at eight years old. He has experienced much of what the program has to offer. David participated at the county, state, and national levels representing the Vermont 4-H Horse Program. So when he decided to look for a new project animal with a specific skill set, all his experience was put into action. He's grown up from the little boy who chose a horse because it was pretty <laughs> to planning out exactly what will be expected of this horse and going out and finding it. David did a lot of research and he talked to a lot of professionals to reach the conclusions in his guide. So David, um, what did you identify as the first steps in finding your project horse? What I have found is you need to make a list. <laughs> what you need and then what you want. That's the key points. Then you need to identify a price range and a distance you're willing to travel. The key here is to prevent disappointment when you begin looking at ads and different sales, not to look at the horse you know you can't travel to or they're out of your price range so that you're prepared to actually go see the horses you like. So it's really you have to come, come up with some pretty hard and fast rules. You do, it really helps you. Are there other factors to consider? Does personal preference play any kind of role? Absolutely. The biggest things you're gonna consider are the age of the horse, sex, height, confirmation, color, and then the training of the horse. The, pers the most personal one on here is color. That's something most people aren't too fussy about unless they're showing in a color breed show. And some of the others, they all fall into the needs and wants. You're gonna have certain ones that it needs to be a certain age or it needs to be a certain size, but others, there's a lot more room for different variation. Mm -hmm. And so once someone has considered important issues like cost and physical characteristics, are there additional research to be done even before you leave home? Absolutely. That's very important, especially when you're going to be traveling long distances. The background of the horse, you especially want to know if there's any problems or time off in the horse's history. Mm -hmm. That can point to a red flag right there. But then you want to know about the horse's show history. What's it done with its last owner? You can predict how it's going to work for you. And then the biggest one that I found very helpful is looking at videos and pictures of the horse. You get an idea how that horse acts in a show or at home before you go to see it. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you're actually ready to visit the farm to see the horse? Okay, this is a very important topic. I recommend, if possible, bring a trainer, even a friend. In my case, it was my mom that would come with me to look at horses. They can give you that ground perspective when they see you around and on the horse then I think it's very crucial to handle the horse on the ground. Gives you an idea of the horse's manner, how it's gonna act when you get on it. Just explain what that means, handle the horse on the ground. Certainly, leading know. it around in hand, brushing it, grooming it, those things, you get a feel for the horse's personality almost, how the horse acts towards you, other people. Then you wanna watch someone else ride the horse. Now, you still need to get on the horse yourself because you can see a trainer or an owner that knows the horse very well and they can represent the horse at its best. You need to get on the horse and then see it for yourself and see what you can make the horse do as a base level that you can build from over time. So when you put all this information together, what conclusions did you draw about finding the ideal horse? Okay, what I found out was the horse needs to be active in the discipline you're looking to participate in. It needs to be mentally and physically sound and it needs to be able to continue its work at the level you 
a desire for the amount of time you have in mind. And then lastly, you need to be able to afford to purchase this horse and maintain it so that you continue enjoying it. So what horse did you ultimately find? I found a 10-year-old quarter horse from Ontario. I had to make some compromises. I wanted a horse that was around 15 hands tall, under eight years old. This horse ended up being a little shorter than I wanted and a little older, but he had a lot more training than I thought I'd be able to afford. And so you obviously learned a lot. You were able to share what you learned with others. Um, that's fantastic. Tell me a little bit about, though, you actually had, you know, another sort of fly in the ointment when you found your horse because you were dealing with the horse that was in a different country. I was, yeah. So what did you have to do for that? To get Shorty, his name is, back into the United States, <laughs> he was born in the U.S., so that made it a little bit easier. But we had to file different paperwork ahead of time, and then we crossed the border. There's designated border stops you can go over, and then from there, you pass through paperwork with the officials there, they approve it. Then you go to a local vet's office that is one of the designated U.S. vets, and they check the paperwork over and confirm it's the horse that you said you would be bringing across the border. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Did you think you, did you realize you were getting <laughs> into so much work when you started this? No, we didn't. We didn't even realize how, quite how far away he was till we map quested it and prepared to drive to see him the first time. But the planning we did ahead of time made the actual process of bringing the horse back quite simple. It was very, very nice. So tell me a little bit about the timeline that, when did you start looking for the horse till ultimately when you brought him back home? We began looking for horses the end of August when we saw the horse I started the show season with. I was beginning to outgrow her skill set and I needed to move up. And it was a slow process. We looked at a few other horses. Finding the type of horse I was interested in in the Northeast is difficult. So it. It took a little more searching. There was either Texas or Florida that were the big places we were going to look. Canada, we didn't expect to go to, but when he came up, it looked like a good horse to see. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb, this is obviously a lot of work, and, and uh, it's just amazing to see how much work goes into it. Do most kids even realize that, that this is the kind of thing, the groundwork they have to do if they're looking for the right horse? Um, I would say not every child is as fortunate as David to have um, the support of their parents and um, a real focus for where they want to go. Mm -hmm. So not every every kid will go through what David has, but um, there are a lot of steps that you do need to take to make sure you get a horse that's going to work. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you recommend to the kids when they're when they're thinking about this step? Because it's a big responsibility. I always say um, set goals, right? Make a list exactly what you want to do with this horse, where you want to go with this horse, and how much you have, what are your means for mm -hmm. filling that, and then try to find the horse that matches that the best. Now, David, obviously, um, you know, you've been at this a long time, you've been riding a long time. What, what is your ultimate goal with this horse? With this horse, my goal with him is I'm interested in the National Reigning Horse Association horse shows, and I would like to go for a title eventually, or at least qualify for the finals in Oklahoma City with him. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a big goal, and I'm not sure if I'll accomplish it, but I know I'll have a lot of fun with him and learn a lot showing along the way. Mm -hmm. And so you'll go probably to, to several different states to show, I imagine. Absolutely. We're leaving very soon for a horse show in Springfield, Massachusetts. No kidding. Yeah. And so what do you learn when you go to these different shows, these bigger shows, and see all the animals there? Absolutely. And all I, the competitors. I watch different people ride their horses and how they train their horses different or similar to me, and I can see how it works out for them. I see how different trainers train their young horses, and I get to compare a lot of different things and see a lot of things put to action in the show pen, see what works, what doesn't work. So it sounds like you're always learning. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you both for coming in today. It's a great conversation, a lot of good work, and hopefully you'll help a lot of other kids when they're journey find, finding their perfect horse, too, by making your lists. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, if you know someone um, who's interested in learning about opportunities, the UVM Extension 4-H program, you can call the state office toll-free. That number is 1-800-571-0668. Well, it's time now to see what's growing in the garden. We're all at the height of harvest season, so let's join UVM Extension's Leonard Perry and Richmond Garden author Kathy LaLiberté for an update. 
Today we're back in Richmond at the Garden of Kathy La Liberté to see in August what's still growing and what's ready for harvest. Thanks so much, Kathy, for having us back here. You bet, Leonard. This garden looks gorgeous other times of the year, but now it looks like the peak of production. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of food in this garden right so now. So let's uh, talk about some of the things we have here. It's starting, these, these peppers are gorgeous. Yeah, these are one of my favorite peppers to grow. It's a poblano pepper. Um, they get really, really big. I like the plants are, are big and really hefty. These aren't steak. They just stand up really wow. straight and strong and uh, have these huge, huge peppers. Um, really meaty. They have to be delicious. big and sturdy to hold up they those do, peppers. They do. They're kind of hot. I don't like the hot peppers. I like more of the sweet ones. It looks like that's what those orange ones are. Yeah, that's a variety called Oranos. Um, and they're super sweet and few of them make it into the house. I just eat them right Well, the they're garden. just gorgeous. It's an ornamental too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, beside us, something we haven't, haven't seen before and it's shade cloth over some, looks like some lettuce and greens. Yep. Tell us about that. Um, well, I use a lot of shade cloth, especially for um, re-sowing plants in the summertime. So under here I have um, fall crops of arugula and lettuce. Um, cilantro, some other stuff like that. And so the shade cloth keeps the soil temperature down so it's not so hot. It also holds moisture um, so, th so things can germinate more easily. I don't have to water every day. And um, this year it's protecting them from rabbits. That's a great idea. And another idea I don't think we've seen before is it looks like squash growing up on yep, a trellis. Yeah, I trellis this, that squash. It's an Italian squash. Um, it has a really long neck. Um, and a big bulb on the bottom. And the neck is long, and the nice thing about that is that you can um, slice it, there's no seeds inside. Wow. But they're very heavy, like probably as heavy as a baseball bat when they get mature. And I use these little tomato clips to clip them up there and keep them high, and it saves a lot of space. I also think it, save, it helps with the, um, I haven't had any squash vine borer problems this year. Hmm. And maybe having them up might help with that, I don't know. Before we talked about leeks and the potential new problem, the leek moth, but you've got a beautiful Beautiful. Before you had a beautiful set of onions coming along. I understand you've had a problem yeah, with those. Yeah, just uh, probably 10 days ago they were, you know, ready for the state fair. But now they have what I think is um, powdery mildew, which is uh, made the foliage, it's kind of gray and um, melted looking. But I'm leaving them there because I don't think it's going to affect the bulbs. And I have been using the bulbs in the kitchen. Um, they're, they seem to be fine. And as the bulbs, uh, as the tops crash over, which means that they're ready to be pulled, um, I am pulling them, but I'm going to let the ones that are still upright, I'm just going to wait. So even if people have onions without that problem, they should wait until the tops start falling over and that's a sign to harvest yeah, them. Yeah, unless you need it in the kitchen, then you should just take it right away. And that's a good point too. A lot of this <laughs> stuff, you don't, there isn't a golden moment. You have to wait till. That's if you right. want some onions, harvest them. You want some peppers. Like, Absolutely. You know, if they're not colored yet, I know ours usually don't get colored because we're eager You're for peppers. Them? and we. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, speaking of some of these things, I brought some in my garden along today to oh, show. Good. So let's take a look All at right. that. Well, here's some of the garlic I harvested, Kathy. These are uh, we harvested when the top started dying back, like you want to do with garlic, and then we uh, put it in a warm, well-ventilated place to dry. Um, and I noticed you've got some too. Yeah, I, I harvested these about two weeks ago, and we have them hanging in the barn, so they're not quite as as dry and pale as yours, but they, they will be soon. So once these green areas start to get more yep. uh, white like this, they're dry, and then it's the time to clean them up. So what you want to do is cut the roots off there on the bottom and then cut the tops off pretty much just above the bulb, maybe about half an inch or so. And then you can, uh, if there's any dirt, um, loose things like that, you can clean it off to clean them up a bit. And then you have garlic ready to store again. Non-freezing, I found. They don't like freezing. But uh, <laughs> right. uh, there's a nice uh, clove there. So that's the garlic. And next to me here are some lettuce. Now this is a variety I love. It's a red romaine called out Regius. Funny name. Um, but then you notice I've got another box coming along with some seedlings that will, it's amazing to think those will look like this in a few weeks. Yeah. So again, a succession uh, to have something coming for fall. 
And then over the right, uh, late summer is a good time to pot up some herbs to bring indoors on a sunny windowsill. Uh, these are some that are wise grown. The tall one is a basil, basil perpetua. It's a great upright one. Um, it stays at nice shape. It's pretty variegated too. And then in front is a thyme. It's regular cooking thyme and then a hot and spicy oregano. So just some examples of herbs if you have limited space or uh, outdoors even, they're great to use. Early in the season we showed some potatoes sowing. I love these grow bags. Um, love growing potatoes in them. You can, uh, grow bags are great if you don't have a great soil, if it's not well drained, if it's too wet, or if you're limited on space. So we sowed some potatoes. These, you see, are dying back. Mm -hmm. That's a sign they're ready to harvest. So we'll kind of dump it out. This is the one called Yukon Gold. The other thing, they're pretty nice, easy to harvest. You just kind of dump it out. Whoops, here comes one. Right. So you see you got some potatoes and you just kind of pull them out. And you oh, see some really beautiful. nice, beautiful potatoes. You don't maybe get as many as you do in the ground, but it, it's just a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Leonard and Kathy, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.